Gaius Aurelius Cota, Consul 75 BCE. The oldest of three brothers who would all go on to hold the consulship, Gaius Cota is mostly known for his triumph in Gaul. He also, along with his brothers, holds the distinction of being an uncle on the maternal side of someone named Gaius Julius Caesar. Gaius Cota was, in addition, someone who was one of the more prominent politicians during the mid-70s, a period where the Solon Order was falling apart and when Rome was largely bereft of any real political talent outside of young Pompey the Great. In this video, I'd like to look at Gaius's career and talk about why he matters for Roman history in this period more generally. Gaius Aurelius Cota was born around the year 124 BCE. He was from a noble plebeian family. This family dated back to perhaps the 3rd century BCE, and that was around the time when it first produced consuls. By the time that Gaius came of age, his family was po uh, prosperous and also very numerous. There are many people in this general time frame sharing their name, most of whom had to be uncles or cousins, but I don't know the exact family tree. I do know, though, that this was a pretty large family by the standards of noble Roman houses. Gaius's father, Lucius Aurelius Cota, served as consul in 119, and his father before him, who also bore the name Lucius, had served in the 140s. Gaius had two younger brothers, Marcus, who served as consul in 74, and Lucius, who served as consul in 65. One thing that's worth noting about the three brothers and their respective ages is that Gaius was a good deal older than Marcus. By my calculations, if Gaius was born in 124, Marcus would have been born around 116. The reason for the age gap um, not corresponding with the gap in their holding of the consulship is that Gaius's career was greatly delayed by all the turmoil of the 80s, which was quite a bit worse for him than it was for most other Romans, as we'll see. As for Lucius, his birth was so far after his two brothers that it's likely that the older Lucius Aurelius Cota, who was the father of this bunch, had more than one wife. Otherwise, it would be not all that likely that one woman would have given birth to this many children over such a long period of time, although of course it is not by any means impossible. Gaius had a sister named Aurelia Cota, who married an up-and-coming patrician whose family was turning things around named Gaius Julius Caesar. This couple gave birth to the future dictator, Gaius Julius Caesar, who is by far the most famous person related to Gaius Aurelius Cota, and it's not particularly close. Like many of the ambitious young Romans who had senatorial aspirations, Gaius Aurelius Cota originally made his name in the Roman courts. This was a place where young ambitious Romans could either prosecute for the public interest or else win friends in high places by defending officials who were under fire from other young Romans who were trying to make a name for themselves. Gaius Cota would be much more successful than most of his contemporaries in this regard because he was a better orator than the vast majority of them. In 92, he was able to defend his uncle Publius Rutilius Rufus when he was unjustly accused of extortion in Asia. Physically deficient in some way, we're not exactly sure how, Cota was not really able to utilize passion or emotion in his speeches, so he had to rely instead on careful research and avoiding all forms of digression which might tire him out or bore his audience. And by sticking closely to facts and reasoning and cool logos, Kota was able to orate effectively and really even impress a young Cicero who found his style to be pure and very persuasive. I would also argue that because of what we know about Caesar's style, that his style was straight to the point and pure unadorned and very um, excellent Latin, that he learned quite a bit from his uncle Gaius when it came to how to talk to a crowd. Caesar, of course, did not suffer from any real physical deficiencies, so if he needed to use emotion, he could do it. 
So he was basically Gaius Kota plus the ability to yell if he needed to. Um, Kota was also a close political ally of Marcus Livius Drusus the Younger, the Tribune of 91, who engaged in all manner of reform and then died trying to secure citizenship rights for the Roman or the uh, Latin and Italian allies. Olivius Drusus the Younger, at the time of his death, had been lobbying the Senate to allow the Italian and Latin allies to have full Roman citizenship. And when he was assassinated, this sent a signal to the Italians that Rome would never grant them this. So they revolted, and the result was the Social War, which was two or three years of brutal and intense combat in Italy. For, not, for reasons that are quite understandable, the Roman people and the Senate were quite upset about this, and they were looking for a scapegoat. Their scapegoat was Livius Drusus himself, and one way to allay their anger was to go after his associates. Since Gaius Cota was one of his closest political allies, he was naturally suspected of being in league with the Italians. Of course, it is worth stating that there is no evidence that Livius Drusus the Younger was ever in league with the Italians. And in fact, he reported one of their plots to his political enemy to protect Roman lives at one point. But that didn't matter for the people who passed the Lex Varia law and set up a court to essentially try allies of Livius Drusus and accuse them of being sympathizers of the Italians. Um, it wasn't long before Gaius Cota's name emerged in connection with this. And after being accused of helping the Italians, Gaius Cota opted to go into exile and avoid the hysteria rather than being executed. So he went into exile, we're not told where, and he would stay away for about eight or so years. And earlier I mentioned the age gap between Kota and his brothers. This is the main reason why their consulships are much closer together than their actual ages, because Kota will spend about eight years in parts unknown, waiting for the situation in Rome to cool down. It's rather clear that Gaius Aurelius Cota, just like almost all of the members of his family and all of his known in-laws, was more on what we might call the popularis side of the spectrum. However, and for reasons that are not immediately clear, he only returned to Rome in the year 82 when Sulla emerged victorious from the civil war against the Senate faction which in its last incarnation was led by Carbo. In 82, when uh, Kota came home, Sulla was dictator and he was in the midst of his prescriptions. For whatever reason, Kota was not harassed at all. Most likely it's because he just was not a very big fish and in his absence, the elite of Rome had largely forgotten about him. So he wasn't very far advanced along the cursus norm at that point and I doubt that Sulla perceived him as any kind of a threat. Maybe at some point he met with Sulla or one of his chief lieutenants and assured them that he was willing to play ball in the new political order. At any rate, uh, Gaius Aurelius Cota was able to go back to Rome and resume his work as a Roman politician. He would go on to keep winning offices and advancing up the curses of Norum. It was only in 75, when Gaius served as consul, that he would reveal his true colors as a proto-popularis. That year, along with his youngest brother Lucius, who seems to have been serving as tribune, the brothers Cota would go about dismantling the Solon system, at least in some of its aspects. The younger brother Lucius was able to repeal an obscure Solon law, De Judiciis Privitas, the significance of which is difficult to gauge, but the fact that it was recorded in our sources means that it must have been somewhat important. So that was a blow to one part of the Solon Order, but it would be Gaius, the eldest brother and consul, who would strike the biggest blow of all to the Solon system. In my opinion, the most important part of the Solon system is that it effectively segregates the tribunate and makes it a dead-end office. If you're an ambitious Roman, the tribunate is not an option because under the Solon system, if you hold that office, you're ineligible for anything beyond it. And this was meant to discourage ambitious Romans from using the office and passing legislation through the people's assemblies. However, Gaius was able to remove that prohibition 
and placed the Tribunate back on the Curse of Sonorum. So what that did was not only save the career of his younger brother Lucius, which I'm sure incidentally was not a small consideration, but what it did was restore the political constitution that the Romans had always enjoyed. In many ways, I imagine that the Kota brothers, when they were promoting this, were actually able to claim to be the more traditional um, faction when it came to this issue, because it was actually a Roman tradition for the assemblies to have sovereignty and to pass laws. So uh, this would have been the crowning achievement of Gaius's career, at least politically. And this was the most impactful thing that he did in office, the thing that had the most far-reaching resonance. The Solon Order indeed had crumbled since Gaius apparently did not meet with all that much blowback after his legislative achievement and effective gutting of the Solon Order. In 74, Gaius Cota was assigned to Gaul to serve as proconsul, and this was at a time when there seems to have been some active threat, so Gaius would have the opportunity to win distinction. We don't know the details or how the campaign actually went, but we do know that Gaius was able to win a triumph for his deeds in Gaul. We're also not informed, by the way, whether he was in Gallia Cisalpina or Gallia Transalpina, but at any rate, either of those could have been under threat, so it would make sense either way. On the day before he was due to celebrate his triumph after he returned home in 73, his old wounds opened. We're not really sure what wounds he had suffered, but apparently those had been suffered on his campaign in Gaul. And I guess when he was exerting himself trying to mount a horse or something like that, one of these wounds opened up. And we're not really told explicitly that he died as a result of this, but the fact that he's never mentioned again does heavily imply that he died right before he was set to celebrate a triumph. If so, that is a sad death and it oddly presages Caesar's career, since Caesar, of course, would go on to conquer Gaul and never really fully reap the benefits of his achievement since he would remain so busy and would ultimately not get to enjoy his time as dictator. Aside from his purely political achievements, Gaius Aurelius Cota ended up having a cultural significance as well and he appears in a couple of Cicero's most important dialogues. Earlier when I was talking about um, Gaius Cota's speaking abilities and techniques, I gathered all of that information from Cicero's De Oratore. Um, Gaius appears as an interlocutor in De Natura Deorum, which is a tractate on the various ways that different philo uh, philosophical schools view the gods, and in that dialogue, Gaius Cota appears as the representative of the New Academy skeptical school of thought on the gods. And by the way, Roman skepticism amounted to we should follow all of the traditions and superstitions of our ancestors and perform them as if they're real, even though we don't really know if they are or not. But it's been working, so we should just keep doing it and hoping for continued good results. There are also some fragments of Sallust history. Um, I think a lot of people probably assume that Sallust is complete because we have complete text for the Juggerthine War and for the Catalinarian Conspiracy. However, his longer work that was called the History has been lost except for a handful of fragments. And one of those fragments actually happens to be the substance of a speech that Gaius Cota delivered to calm down popular anger during a grain shortage. And if you're a speaker who is not very good at using emotion, that would be a dangerous position to be in. Presumably, this would have dated to the year of his consulship in 75, since otherwise it would be hard to imagine why he would be the person who would be trotted out to deal with the masses at a time of famine. But he indeed apparently was able to um, quiet the uh, anxiety of the Roman people and that crisis was resolved. So that may also be evidence that this was a crisis he faced in his consulship that he most certainly had to surmount it, otherwise we'd hear more about it. What is the legacy of Gaius Aurelius Cota? He was one of the most talented orders of his day and stylistically he managed to influence Cicero who had become the greatest of all the Roman orders. 
It's also worth noting that Cicero shared Cota's New, Aca New Academy uh, skepticism, so apparently Cota influenced Cicero in a deeper way as well. Cota was one of the first senior Roman officials who successfully struck a major blow at the Solon Order. I would argue that restoring the tribunate to its full function and as a stepping stone for ambitious plebeians was the key pillar of the Solon Order, and this was really the most important way that the Popularis faction was able to revive itself. So you could make an argument and be correct that someone else could have easily done this, but it was Gaius, and he did it in the year 75, which meant that by the time that his nephew Caesar was running for office, that the institutions were in place for the populares to do what they needed to do to win. The prestige that Gaius and his two brothers accrued by serving as consuls bolstered the early career of their nephew Caesar, and without their influence and their name power, it's quite likely that Caesar would not have been able to accomplish the things that he did. So now the question becomes, who was the greatest of the Kota brothers? I think that if we're just looking at what they achieved in their own right and their significance as a one-off figure in history without relation to their political allies, I actually think it's a clear win for Gaius Aurelius Kota. He is the only one who had a real cultural resonance in uh, oratory or philosophy. He was militarily the most successful of the three brothers and by a long shot. And had he lived longer and perhaps been healthier, he could have done some truly impressive things. It's a real tragedy for him that he was not able to live longer and enjoy what he had achieved in Gaul.